What a dump. <laughs> no, I had planned to to say that, so I thought I would, but it isn't the first thing I thought of tonight, but I had no idea of this reception. I don't know how many of you know what that's like to stand here, especially since you must all have numb fannies. <laughs> You've sat and looked at this same face through the years, and I love Mr. Johnson, I admire him, but he has something to do for me for showing you my first movie, Bad Sister. <laughs> but there is an interesting story about that. I own a print of that purely because it was my first film. For no other reason, I can assure you. <laughs> Any time a young contract player at Warner's, as the years went by, and I had sort of gotten there, was really discouraged, I would say, save tomorrow evening, I would get permission for a projection room, I would run Bad Sister for her. <laughs> and I would say, you see, anything is possible, never give up. <laughs> this is true, this is true, it became a very valuable film to many people. And uh, in a way, I'm glad you saw that, because that's how they start us out out there, at least they did back then. Anyway, your welcome is, um, well, what you say? Thank you. Questions? Ms. Davis, I would like to ask you one that's been puzzling me for years. In, in 1947, Mr. Noble's book mentioned that when you were up for the film of Human Bondage, that though they didn't legally give you the nomination, it was a writing and they gave you a special quote. What is this? No, uh, what, what happened, Dangerous, as you saw some of today, in which, in my opinion, was not a terribly good film, was what I won the Oscar for, right? Uh, my first Oscar. Uh, it really was a consolation prize for Bondage the year before. Prior to this, uh, there, were, there was no Price Waterhouse at all. And uh, it was rather divided among the studios, if I must be very frank. Each year, one studio, one film would more or less get everything. And there really was such a furor about Mildred. And so many people wrote in, in fury that I didn't get it, that next year they had the Price Waterhouse Company. So that's the real truth. <laughs> get that. <laughs> Jimmy Durante's show? Yeah, I did Pita Pita. Yes, yes. Arthur Blake started Betty Davis. <laughs> no, what, what I mean is Arthur Blake started the caricature uh, and the impersonation of Betty Davis. Uh, for many, many years, no one imitated me and it frightened me to death. Because I think... No, I think unless you attain a point where there's something so definite about you can imitate it, you must be a rather dull performer. And Arthur started with the swinging of the arms and the whole bit. No, no, the only other one I've, well, I've seen many people do me. Well, it, it, well it's a compliment. Uh, it has gotten to a point now, the way they do me, uh, every now and then, I might get a little irked. <laughs> But basically, it is a compliment. I truly think that way about it. What? Of the earlier years is my all-time love, Dark Victory. Because it, I loved the girl. Most of all, I loved the story. I loved what the director did with it. And really, when anyone asks you what you have a, if, if you have a favorite film, it must have all the ingredients as a finished product. And as a matter of fact, I never ever went and saw myself till years later in any film I did, but I did want to see Victory, so they gave me a projection room all alone. And when I finished seeing it, I walked across the Warner lot, and I was so ashamed because I couldn't get a grin off my face. And I felt so immodest that I was so pleased with it. 
But I think script-wise, director-wise, I thought that Mr. Brent was just beautiful in it. And uh, it's my all-time favorite of all those years. What do you really think of Joan Crawford? <laughs> <laughs> what do you... What, do you, what is well, your no, opinion of Joan Crawford? You, you, you really... Is this a gag question? Or, I mean, you want me to say something vile about her? No, let me tell you something very interesting. There were never two more opposed actresses working together in the world. Uh, just total, totally different people and systems. But I will say this for Miss Crawford. She is a professional. She is always on time. She knows her lines. And we made Jane, you know, in three weeks, Joan and I. Three weeks. Because that is all the money anybody would give for us. Because whenever Mr. Aldrich went to anybody for backing for this, they say, those two old broads never. <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. And finally he got enough money, and we met, we, one week rehearsal and three weeks shooting we did Jane, and it wasn't easy. But I had, I had great respect for her as a professional. That she is. And I wish I were half as beautiful. That I will say for her. <laughs> Well, now, if you want to meet me privately sometime... <laughs> <laughs> no, professionally, this, I am saying, is how I feel. But if we want another... We'll meet you outside. Why you did not get the role? Well, I lost it myself. This is uh, about Gorm with the Wind. Why didn't Miss Davis get the part of Scarlett O'Hara? Yes, well, it was bought for me by Warner's. At the time when I was in revolt because I did not have good scripts, I did not have good directors, I'd been there about five years, and I knew that unless I was under the guidance of good directors and good scripts, there would be no career. So I had been out of Warner's for two months, and I was prepared to stay forever. Mr. Warner sent for me one day to beg me to come back and forget the revolt. And as bait, he said... I've just optioned a marvelous new book for you by a woman named Margaret Mitchell called Gone with the Wind. I said, I'll bet that's a pip of a story. <laughs> me. me, myself, and I. So I go to England and had the famous court case and all. I was gone from Warner's about a year. And when I came home, I found out what a pip of a story it really was. Then there was a deal on for Errol Flynn and I to do it together, a request from Mr. Selznick. But I honestly, in all, with all Errol's charm and heavenly face and all, he was not a Rhett Butler, and I would not do it with him. So then they found Miss Lee, and thank God for all of us, because she contributed much to the screen. But I'd have given my life to have played it. We all know that. Had you ever considered playing Eliza Gant in Look Home with Angel? Uh, life is full of terrible things in this business I've been in. Uh, I was all signed and set to play Eliza Gant in New York. And I opened a door in a rented house one day and fell down 15 steps and broke my back and was out two years. The, nobody's asked me to do it on the screen. I'm about to go, when I go to, to Los Angeles and go to Paramount and say, please, I would love to play Liza again. Uh, no, I'm really not Margot Channing. I wish I were in a way. No, uh, I really am not Margot. I'm not Margot Channing's type actress. I'm really not. Uh, maybe I'd have had a better life had I been. The problems of Margot Chatting, which is why I think it's such a beautifully written film and part, the, the, the human problems of hers are the human problems of any actress. No question about it. The growing older in the whole thing, which is why I think it's a classic. And it, I don't think there'll ever be a better story written about theatre people than that, ever. I made a record of both parts. This is regarding Dead Ringer. <clears throat> Dead Ringer. I made a, <clears throat> a record. It had never been done before. So in other words, I had my own timing for each character, which I played too. Then, of course, we had a double back too, naturally. 
but it was all done according to my performance each time. Because I don't think much of the film Dead Ringer, but I think the split screen was unbelievably brilliantly done. And that was Mr. Paul Henry, who was the director of that. When is your next picture? The, the next picture is Connecting Rooms. The one I made this year. With Michael oh, Ripley. heaven knows what the next will be. Maybe never. You know, you, you, you never... <laughs> well, no, you don't know. You see, it, it's, a, it's a brand new world today in my industry. And um, I have a deep desire to say in the same category, which is above the title. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, there are not many parts for someone my age that, well, that's very sweet of you, but uh, I, I, I benefited from the uh, love of youth that Hollywood had for all those years, and so I have to admit now that I'm older, and then someone else has the opportunities that I had as a younger person, because I played many older parts when I was a younger person. and. Uh, it's just very hard to find properties. I have a deep dream to play Mary Lincoln, but who, I, who will ever me, let me do it? I don't know. That's the problem. Yes. Just a minute. Just oh, I've given up. <laughs> I've given up. I really... Um, I've had a, something between the two boys for years, and every year there's a possibility, like the last one was Jane, and I really, that year was kind of secure that it was going to work. And I got the shock of my life. It didn't work. So I went back and told the boys they weren't going to have a little brother. So I don't know if any more. <laughs> so I don't really know if, uh, I don't think it's as much of a dream now as it was at the time of Jane, really. If it happened, I would be. But of course, the kick has gone out of it now because I always want to be the first, you see. And I would not now really be the first to get three. Miss Hepburn did beat me to it. We have to hand that to her. I started in the theater. I went to a dramatic school, and uh, I was very, very lucky in the theater. My hard years were when I uh, uh, came to California with Universal, making Bad Sister and a few of those little things. And then it took me a, a, a good time. Uh, at, at Warner's to, to really get the ball rolling. As a matter of fact, the secretary of the man that really started me is right here, Frida, Mr. William Wyler's secretary, very old friend of mine. And I consider that the real beginning of going into a whole other class film really was Jezebel. And from then on, it was just then I had the good fortune to work with him because he, to me, is... There never will be another like him. And the next one coming along, I think, is Mike Nichols. I think he will have the same career. Yes. Now, if you're sitting here, Mike, I'm not doing that to get a job. <laughs> what? Okay, but I mean it, and you know it. As a matter of fact, Mike Nichols and I met in San Francisco really and truly for the first time exactly 10 years ago, just personally. So this has been, a, his career is a big thrill, and to have him have a tribute day seems impossible yes. to all. Yes. <laughs> have you ever thought of becoming a comedian? I'm wondering that because you can't I am one. <laughs> No, it, uh, I wasn't fortunate that way. Uh, I would have liked to have had more what I call situation comedies to play through those years. But you know, they're fewer and far, uh, farther between than tragedies, really. And of course, my natural bent always was tragedy. For instance, June Bride was a film that was a situation comedy that I enjoyed making very, very much, as opposed to a Pratt for a comedy called The Bride Came C.O.D., which I did not enjoy making very much. But I wish there had been more. Margot Channing has a marvelous area of comedy, which is one thing that I enjoyed about her. Well, that's your privilege, sir. <laughs>
Well, I, I have, you know. I did Night of the Iguana. I was here in San Francisco not ten years ago with the world of Carl Sandburg. Uh, well, we had a marvelous time here. Everybody was really, it was the most enjoyable engagement. Uh, I, I much prefer motion pictures. I don't really have a desire to ever do theater anymore. How many films have you made? Well, it's, it's very near 90-ish, 100. I don't really know anymore. Yes. Uh, all-time favorite. You have. Well, you, you can't have an all-time. I, I have, you know, five or six that... I certainly love Jezebel. As a character, uh, I worship Queen Elizabeth as a character. <laughs> I don't think the films were uh, the best they could have been, but the, the woman I adored doing. Um, certainly, later on, All About Eve. Um, let's see, anyone oh, no. else? Oh, Voyager, very favorite film of mine. Very. Uh, the Letter, a very favorite film of mine. Um, that's all I can think of right now. <laughs> uh, well, I, I thought Mr. Skeffington was a... was almost a terribly good film. Almost. I would have adored to have made a real film as... Let me repeat yes, that, because they can't hear. Right. Are there many actors and actresses that you would like to work with that you have not worked with? I played a very small uh, part with Mr. Tracy in a little thing we made at Warner's called 20,000 Years of Sing Sing, long before he'd been discovered, and I was certainly starting. And I would have given anything to have done a really, you know, serious film with, with Spencer, I must say, whom I admired enormously. Uh, Michael Redgrave, I realized that ambition this year. I always wanted to do a really good film with Jimmy Cagney. But the system then was, you know, that if we could carry the films on our own at the box office, we never got together, as opposed to today where they have 50 in every film, you know. It wasn't that way then at all. So we never had a chance to really work together, because he I admired enormously, too. And... Um, well, he and I would have been awfully different, you know, because he was the most marvelous, brilliant kind of comedian. And then, of course, it was, you know, some of the gorgeous sex boys like Cooper and Gable and all those that I never worked with, that, that of course, would have been marvelous fun. But they were all at Metro and I was at Warner's, so we never got together. Up there. <laughs> have you ever worked with Ronald Reagan? Have you ever worked with Ronald Reagan? Yes, indeed, he was in Dark Victory. He was my, uh, the bow that loved her so and didn't get her. Yes. <laughs> Politically, also, he didn't get her. <laughs> yes. Hollywood, Hollywood seems to have changed so much in the, in, in the, in the, over the years. Do you think that uh, the concentration on film today takes away from the development of personalities in film? Well, I, don't, I, I think this is true with many directors. I think it is more, more of a director's and cameraman's day than it ever was uh, years ago. Also, you see, your contract system has made a great, great difference for the performer because it's kind of one chance at a time now. And then if that picture is great and you make a, a, a hit in it, then you will get another one. If your misfortune is it isn't very good, then it may be a long wait. And we just, you know, went from week after week after week. I was at Warner's, say, 18 years and almost never stopped. And I feel that was my good fortune. And I feel it's much tougher today for the player. Did you ever get a chance to uh, choose... Uh, and work with your directors, certain directors uh, that you felt were better for you as an actress? Trying to think. Uh, Warner's hired Mr. Wyler for me for Jezebel, which is my good fortune. Um, I don't remember if I requested him for the letter. I probably didn't have to. Maybe they hired him again. I honestly don't remember. Uh, I used to fight the directors that I knew were lousy, you know, of which there are hundreds and hundreds. 
Um, there were many directors I would love to have worked with that I didn't, because each studio was kind of its own little city, you know. Uh, you certainly had the right to turn, uh, turn a director down if you wanted to. But in the later years, I was fortunate to have, you know, some, some good directors. For instance, Edmund Goulding, was, yes, you know, who yes. did Dark Victory, was one of the really great geniuses of, of Hollywood, and I had him for three or four films. So in the long run, I, I, I didn't really have much of a problem that way. I feel there are many people coming up that we can't know in the beginning what they will be. Because in every generation, whether it's direction or writing or painting or name it, there are not too many. And there never were and there never will be. And I feel that there are more young people with a future around today than it seems in their first films. And if, if you remember Bad Sister, I am right. Because you couldn't have picked me to get anywhere except across the street. <laughs> what do you think about the multi-million dollar productions of today in contrast to the budget that was given to your films? Well, I think it's an enormous handicap. But uh, then uh, everything has changed. Uh, we can't compare the prices that it cost to make films in 1930 or 40 to now, can we? Because everything in the world has gone up. You know, the union prices have gone up. Everything has gone up. So uh, not being a producer, I'm not uh, awfully competent to answer this. It would seem to me they're giving themselves an enormous handicap. And it seems to me that there'll be more and more and more independent films that are made inexpensively. And I think that's the way it should go. Yes, sir. When you did Night of the Iguana on the stage, did you get to know Tennessee Williams very well? And what were your impressions of him? Well, he's a brilliant man. Uh, we did not see a great deal of him. Uh, we saw him at, at rehearsals or if something had to be done with the play. But I don't feel I can say I know him very well, no. What do you think about the... Mis Miss Streisand uh, or other high salaried actors and actresses getting a million dollars for their first movie? Well, you know, I, I'm hesitating because I don't wish to sound uh, uh, jealous. <laughs> uh, but I have to tell you, I would be uncomfortable as a person. I would have been and would now, at any point in my career, getting a million dollars to play a part. And I think the only dangerous part of it is that it is keeping men out of the production area. Because if you pay these salaries to actors plus all the other costs, what man is going to get any percentage left in the world uh, to produce? And I think possibly that's one thing that is, is, is very sad today about these salaries. I, I just would be uncomfortable. Really, really and truly, and a million dollars would be lovely, but I would be uncomfortable. Yes. Also, in the beginning was the word, right? The script. Without which... Well, I was one of the most fortunate women in the, in the scripts I was given to play, uh, for which I'll thank Mr. Hal Wallace all my life, because he bought those for me to do. Uh, We've made stories and concentrated on the people and not, you see, I never went on a location in my life. You know, I never, if we had the petrified forest, there were two sound, you couldn't tell it wasn't the pet. We, I never went on a location in all those 18 years, unless it was like, you know, dragging to that train and beyond the forest, you know. I was out all night, three nights doing that, I might tell you. Uh, I thought I never would die in that one, but anyway. <laughs> But I think it has to do, you see, this is why I say that of the new directors, I will pick the future of Mike Nichols. Because Mike Nichols knows from the things I've seen him do that what you have for the most part are the people. Not what's behind them, not whether you're in Rome on the Appian Way. It is people. This is what the French people knew for years when they'd have those gorgeous French actors sometimes be just in one shot for 15 minutes. Just acting. Acting has become a little old-fashioned. 
You see, we don't really sort of need to act anymore because of the exterior of everything. You are completely right. But that's why, unless Mike changes, of course, he's very young. You never know what he'll do, you know. <laughs> But I don't think so, because I think he knows this basic principle. That's what Mr. Wyler knew when he made a film like The Best Years of Our Lives, the people. And you became involved with the people because, secondly, the public makes stars. No producer on earth can make you box office. It's the public. But the public over the years with, with, with those of us who did make it, got to know us as people in different forms, but they got to know it, and, they, and we belong to them. That almost is impossible today. It really is. Would you well, like... I have liked to do it again. The question I was, beg, would you like to do the I, Oh, you say it. <laughs> say it. The question was, would you, would you like to have done Virginia Woolf? Would I have liked to have done Virginia Woolf? I begged, I pleaded, I asked for... Comp this is long before Mike Nichols was involved. Long before Mike Nichols was involved. So uh, I can't blame him. Whether he was responsible or not, I'll never ask him. But actually, uh, this is, I don't think this is true. I asked him kind of tentatively last evening, and uh, he was very nice about it all. But that was, that was, seriously, with a few parts for someone like me today, that was the heartbreak of my life, not to play Virginia Woolf. I didn't get over it for a long time. Hmm? Would you have changed the first page where it refers to better? No, I'd have done myself. <laughs> The only claim to fame beyond the forest has is that Mr. Albee wrote What a Dump. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, Mr. Johnson tried to find it in Beyond the Forest. And all I do in the film is I'm dusting a table and I'm just saying, What a Dump. I don't do anything with it, but he just used it and made that lousy film famous. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. What do you think of your... What do you think of your movie, The Star, with Sterling Hayden? I think, script-wise, that is one of the best scripts of what happens to an ordinary talent in Hollywood that has ever been written. I mean that. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was... Uh, so kind of true. Well, maybe when I'm dead, they'll bring it out again and people will go more. You never know. Any kind of very calm uh, part, that was a very difficult part for me. Um, let's see what else. Lots of them are difficult, but they're in a, an area that I enjoy more. Um, <laughs> uh, the gentleman says that Miss Davis is a person of... <laughs> All right, are you a bitch on the set? <laughs> wait, wait, wait a minute, my bitch. Uh, may I tell you something? I'm going to let you... Frida, you can speak for me in a minute. Because she's, be, she's Wyler's secretary. She's been, her boss was a worse bastard than I was a bitch. <laughs> No, uh, let me, I'll be very serious with you about this. You know, as years go by, the stories grow. And each person tells another person. And it gets worse and worse. I am not a bitch on a set. Number one, uh, there, is no, there is no way of making a film as a leading player and making everybody uncomfortable. If I was in a position of a really incompetent director and I was a person who had to believe in what she was doing or I couldn't do it uh, I would be forced for self-preservation to fight back but no I, I never I don't believe in it now 
And also, I always went to the head man. If I had a real quarrel, I didn't go to the poor assistant who couldn't do anything anyway, I would go right up to Mr. Warner's office, state my case, and, and see what happened. I truthfully am not. Honest. I have somebody to give an affidavit. Frida, this is Mr. William Wallace, Secretary Frida. Years ago. I paid her to come No. no. <laughs> I knew I was going to no. ask that question, and I needed it. No, I, I was sitting here patiently and politely waiting so that I could say something to all you people, because I have been with Miss Davis many, many years ago. I was script supervisor on all the pictures that she uh, did with William Wyler. And I've been most fortunate because through all the years, I remember how gracious Miss Davis was, not only to her, to the staff, to the crew, but how much she helped each and every unknown, known, every actor that she came in contact with had nothing bad, but always the finest to say about Miss Davis. And through all of my 13 years with Mr. Weiler, I remember Miss Davis as the kindest, most gracious person with whom I have ever worked. This is not only my opinion, but the opinion of most of the people with whom she has actually been in contact. Now, this business of being a bitch, I don't know. I don't know where that ever came from because never through all the years we have been together have I ever heard her say an unkind thing to any co-worker. She would fight for her rights if she felt that a scene was false, if she felt that she were not given the proper screen credit to which she was entitled, if she felt that something was false on the set. She would fight and fight hard, but never against any person with whom she worked. So she was not a bitch on the set. She just fought for her rights. Thank you. In, in line with this story, I, you know, I was never meant to play Margot Channing. I was an accident because Miss Cla Claudette Colbert hurt her back and we had to get to San Francisco to get into the current theater at a certain time. So it was my great good luck that Miss Colbert hurt her back, let me tell you. But uh, when Mr. Mankiewicz signed me for this, he got, oh, hundreds of phone calls. Joe, watch out, brother, what you're in for. You know, and he said, I got one call saying you'll have a charming experience. And I said, who was the one call from? And he said, from William Wyler. So it is only the people who you have had bad experiences with that will blame you and, and not themselves. You know, this is, and, and then the legends grow. And now I have become uh, rather a monster. There's no question about it. Betty, where do you live now? What do you do? I... Uh, <laughs> Where do you live now? What do you do? I live in Westport, Connecticut. Uh, I, I, I love uh, homemaking almost as much as acting. I'm sort of a schizo that way. I enjoy my three children. Also, I have a four-month-old grandson who lives not too far away, and uh, I have a lovely country life and work about once a year. Did you have a favorite male lead? No. I, 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 I like and love many actors in, in, in different parts they play. No, I've never sort of had one. If there was one at all, one human being that I worshipped, it was Claude Rains. <laughs> what do you think about the trend toward nudity in theater today? Oh, it's such a large subject. Uh, number one, <laughs> sometimes very large. Yes. <clears throat> well, you know, it, it is a business, theater and motion pictures. And it's really more or less uh, up to the public what happens with it. Uh, if the public still pays for it, it's going to continue. I thank God I was never faced with this problem as a young actor. 
because I would have given up any great part in the world, I would never have stripped in front of a camera. Never. Never. So I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate, and there are many young women today facing this problem, believe you me. You know, uh, uh, hmm? Why would you not strip in front of a camera? I don't think it's anybody's business. <laughs> Plus, plus I, I guess I'm a romantic. I'd kind of like to save it for some guy in a room some night. <laughs> yes, Irving Rapper, the director, is no! pretty unknown today. He's pretty unknown today. Can you tell us something about working with him? Forget you ever asked the question. <laughs> no, uh, that... Uh, uh, I never felt he was a very good director. He knows that. He, he, he did have one great thing, which is an enormous help. He had enormous taste. Have you liked any of the new films uh, that you've seen recently, like Midnight Cowboy, Bonnie and Clyde, The Graduate? I so stand here ashamed to tell you. I've seen practically none of them. Saw the graduate here yesterday. I'm lazy, and this film festival, with all you marvelous, knowledgeable, enthusiastic people about the industry I love, I'm going to spend the next year going to everything and catch up. This is 40 years I have worked, starting in the theater, 40 years. And I chose motion pictures and they chose me. And just listen to all of you and realize that all of you would sit here all these hours today. It is really very, very thrilling. And there is really hope for the audiences. I can see that. And I, I, I always said, you know, it never was a 13-year-old audience. They've been using that excuse for their lousy movies for years. You know that? <laughs> And uh, it isn't a 13-year-old audience. You're just absolutely marvelous, and you're welcome to me. I really will never forget it back in Westport. Thank you. Thank you.